Pacific herring deposit their eggs on seagrass. Hi! What's going on everybody? My name is Brandon. I'm a marine biologist and an artist and welcome to Nature Meets Paper, the place where we go on an adventure to discover the world of marine biology. I love sharing my experiences with aquatic creatures with you. It's my goal to raise awareness of our beautiful bodies of water and the animals that live in them through science, stories, and art. If you are new to this community, welcome. It's really nice having you here. This is a friendly community where we try to give back. Make sure to stick around to the very end of the video where you can hear more about my monthly charity. As for this episode, today we're going to be discovering the Pacific Herring. Are you ready? Let's dive in! Clupia pelicii is a species of herring found in the North Pacific Ocean. They can be found from Baja, California, up into Alaska and around to Japan. They can be found in marine, freshwater, and brackish habitats. For those who don't know what a brackish water is, it is a mixture of salt and fresh water. The Puget Sound is sort of brackish water since it has input from rivers. These fish are commonly found in pelagic neuritic water. That is habitat from the surface to 200 meters following continental shelves. The term pelagic refers to open ocean. Wow. We just started our trip and we're learning all sorts of new terminology. Pacific herring form large schools that don't migrate. They primarily move in designated area and transit vertically in the water column. Now that we know where we are looking, let's get into the behavior and physical appearance of the Pacific herring. What are we looking for? Pacific herring are a smaller fish species. They grow to a maximum of 46 centimeters, but average 25 centimeters. They have light blue to green dorsal surfaces that change into a brilliant silver and a white stomach. These fish don't have any special markings on their body. This includes light or dark spots. The silver sides flash bright when on the right angle to the sunlight. The interesting thing about this color is that it acts as camouflage. Yeah, it seems weird that silver would be an effective camouflage, but hear me out. The silver effectively picks up and reflects the surrounding colors back at its prey. It's like having a mirror that picks up and spits the color back out. If done correctly, you shouldn't be able to see the mirror. This is the same process. Pacific herring have one dorsal fin that doesn't have any spines. They have a pair of short pectoral fins, a pair of pelvic fins, and a soft anal fin. Their caudal peduncle is severely forked. Let me ask you this. How would you measure a fish's length if it has a forked tail? Would you take a total length or a fork length? I will insert a pole in the eye above. Now that we have a physical identification, let's discover some behaviors. Like I mentioned earlier, Pacific herring form big schools and don't migrate. It is difficult to count how many individuals are in a school when there are so many of them moving around. During breeding season, the herring find shallow water where there are eelgrass seaweed or kelp beds. Females will swim along the bottom of the eelgrass and deposit her eggs sticking her eggs to the bottom side of the eelgrass. Then, males will fertilize the eggs. The cool thing about this behavior is that the whole school can spawn in a few minutes or up to a day. Once a pair of herring spawn, it starts a frenzy for everyone else to spawn. There is no observed pairing of individuals. In an event like this, there can be 6 million fertilized eggs per square meter. Whoa! You wouldn't want to be in the water when that happens. This is a huge number of eggs. So why aren't our oceans overrun by these fish? Well, Pacific herring are keystone species. This means that many animals eat and interact with them. By the time everyone has eaten the herring or has eaten the eggs off the eelgrass, only one in 10,000 fish will survive to adulthood. The interesting thing about this fish is that it doesn't die after spawning. They can survive several years of spawning events. 
Now that we have some information, let's move on to the diet and population health of the Pacific herring. What does the Pacific herring eat? The herring don't have any teeth in their mouth. They have pharyngeal teeth in their throat, but no teeth in their jaws. Juveniles feed on crustacean, decapod, and mollusk larva. Adults feed on crustaceans and small fish. I'm not sure how they chew their food if they don't have any teeth, but they seem to manage. So, how are they doing? The IUCN Red List has them listed as not evaluated. Some populations are thought to be threatened, but there are also some that are endangered. Remember, there is no mass migrations to mix the populations. If a fishery depleted a population, then it will take a while to fix. There used to be huge fisheries that would take too many fish. Pacific herring were used for food, bait, and oil, but now they are regulated for only food and bait fish. The use of herring oil is no longer a thing. One good thing about this fish is that it is harmless to humans, so go swim in a school of herring if you would like. Just make sure you're not doing it during breeding season. It's time for us to discover my encounter with this animal. I was at the Point Divine Zoo and Aquarium. I have encountered Pacific herring other times, but this is where I took this photo. I have eaten pickled herring many times and have seen them in the wild. I have seen a pod of humpback eating them, and that was pretty cool, but this encounter got me eye to eye with them. I had a lot of trouble capturing their shine. Remember, they are silver and reflect their background back at me. The lighting was so dark and my camera struggled with it. The zoo has a round encounter where the herring can swim in a circle at great speeds. You only get to see a small portion of, in, of this in the window. It looks like the herring are swimming into nothingness and appearing out of nowhere. They started on the right and swam to the left. You can't see the curve of the tank so it looks like they just disappear magically. I had to look at the fish with my eyes and try to remember what they look like. I hope that I got the details right in this painting. And with that, I will call this adventure finished. Thanks for watching. Remember to click subscribe and ring the notification bell to be notified when I post new content. I do my best to post new content every single weekend, but sometimes life gets in the way. Or a painting is too detailed to finish in a week. On to my monthly charity. For those of you who don't know or who are new, I have chosen a charity to support every single month, and in March I have helped to support Lupus Research. Links are down below if you want to help that. I have loved hearing your feedback and comments with people who have been affected by this disease. I personally know a few people who have been affected by this disease and I just want to make sure that they can get the treatment or research done to help their lives in the future. If you donate, thank you so much. If you would like a print, send me a message and we can figure out the details and I can send you, I can order that and send you an invoice. If you would like to support this channel, I sell my art. So the art that you just saw me make, I sell that as the originals, as well as museum quality prints. My originals run $12 a linear inch, and my prints run $3 and $6 a linear inch, depending on if they're uh, unlimited edition or a limited edition print. If buying art is not your thing, and you're more into apparel, I also sell, and I'm starting to create more designs on teespring.com. Links are all down below. Thanks again, I've been Brandon, and I will see you in our next adventure.